Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode seven. The Witch Tree Symbol, number 33. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? We sure hope so, and we hope you are too. Join us as we talk Nancy Drew cover to cover and click to click. Welcome to Regular Nancy Drew. There's a lot here. There is. <laughs> There's quite a bit that I almost don't even know how to start talking about it, you know? Mm-hmm. But how did you how did you enjoy it, Corey? It was a much different one than than what I expected. Yeah. I don't know what I was expecting. I well, I texted you earlier this week that I read online, I think it was Wikipedia actually, that this book is supposedly the inspiration for Midnight in Salem, the most recent her interactive game, which I don't understand at all I don't (laughs) I don't see it other than Nancy getting accused of being a witch which doesn't even happen in the game it's someone else who's accused but Mm -hmm. maybe it's because it's book number 33 and game number 33 and that's where the similarities end but oh I didn't even pick up on that yeah no I have absolutely no idea how you could even reason that these two are connected I uh yeah Uh, And I was expecting a fair bit of witchiness and I, you know, because I mean, I love creepy, spooky witchiness. Oh, yeah. There was really nothing witchy about this one. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, aside from the fact that Nancy gets accused of being a witch, basically, but it it wasn't really kind of an issue. I mean, it was a little bit of an issue, but not a big issue. And (laughs) and, uh, there was there was nothing spooky, witchy about it. Just a lot of Amish people. Just yeah. a lot of Amish, a lot of cooking. Mm-hmm. So let's see, three words. Three words. One has to be Amish. Yes. Second one has to be like Amish food. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one, antiques, probably. Antiques, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the witch tree symbol was originally published in 1955. Written by Harriet Stratemeyer Adams and then revised in 75 by Ann Schultz. So I actually read the original and I didn't realize I was reading the original until I got like midway through and I was like, there still feels like a lot left for this book, but I'm coming up on the 28th chapter. (laughs) And so I went to go look at the chapters. I'm like, oh, there's 25. This is the original 1955 version. So I'm interested. Yeah. I'm assuming you read the, the newer one. Yes. Um, so my cover is quite a bit different than yours. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So do you want to describe your cover a little bit, Corey? Yeah, it's just Nancy standing in the dark behind this really large, big old tree. And mm-hmm. it looks kind of kind of a spooky tree. I, I hadn't heard of a witch tree before, but um, they describe it in the book as, as looking like a witch's broom handle, the branches do. So yeah. Yeah. And mine is actually, yeah, I mean, it also features, you know, the witch tree with the witch tree symbol on it. But in the foreground is Nancy and who I assume to be Mrs. Glick and um, her son, Henner, standing in front of a carriage um, and just like looking at that kind of confusedly. It's very colorful, actually. Mrs. Glick is in like this green dress. Nancy's in yellow and we get the blue background. So it's like, you know, very primary color-ish but um nancy's blonde on the cover of this one gotta keep track gotta keep track of when she dyes her hair and when she doesn't dye her hair <laughs> yeah she has red hair on mine so yeah yeah interesting i it's just so interesting i don't know i don't i know we've talked about this and i've harped about this before but i i could have sworn that she was red-haired before she was blonde me too but she was blonde before she was redheaded how weird that you got the original didn't even notice so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I doubt they're that they are that much different if our uh, last episode is anything to go by, but I'm interested to see maybe what we talk about that you're like, hold on, that wasn't in yeah. my version. Yeah. Do you want to do a plot summary? Yeah, let's jump in. Okay. So Nancy is invited to 
I guess it's like a mansion or like this old house that was recently inherited by uh, her neighbor, Mrs. Tenney. She invites her because she's basically spooked. <laughs> she doesn't want to go there by herself for some reason, but she also wants Nancy to go there to see the furniture because mm-hmm. apparently this antique furniture is supposed to be really cool or whatever. So they get to the house and they find that the furniture has been stolen and Mrs. Tenney basically immediately calls out her cousin, Alpha Zinn. She's like, oh, I bet he did it. He He's this antique dealer. She says some awful fashion things about him, at least in my version. Mm-hmm. And Nancy finds a note that has, quote unquote, the witch tree symbol on it. It says witch tree symbol. And it's a symbol of like a circle with like an X through it. Um, Then they hear someone like walking around on the second floor. Mrs. Tenney faints and the whoever it was that was walking around on the second floor is able to escape the house. Nancy has to tend to Mrs. Tenney, who -hmm. eventually does wake up, but the man has already escaped. So really? Okay. This was a little confusing to me because in my version, Mrs. Tenney is like accusing her cousin. Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that it was Alpha Zen. And then she mentions that the other day an antique dealer was there oh, right. kind of checking out the furniture. And Nancy's like, oh, tell me more about him. And she says that his name is Roger Holt, that he found out that she'd inherited this, this mansion with this furniture and he wanted to come take a look. So he comes to take a look and she didn't really think anything of it. But Nancy's like, well, did you lock the door behind you? And she was like, no, I just left him in there and told him to lock up behind himself. But then later in the book, she mentions something about like catching the guy while he was in the house. But I don't remember Nancy being in the house when the guy was first there in the story. So I don't know. Interesting. Maybe I, I think I missed something. Maybe I was trying to read it too okay. fast, but. Well, no. So that definitely, that happened in my version too. I just forgot. Okay. <laughs> she, but she talks about it in the past. So she says that like she had invite because Nancy asked her if anything else strange had happened recently oh, okay. or anything weird about the house. And she says that she had met or like this guy randomly introduced himself to her saying he was an antique dealer. And can he come look around at the furniture in the house? And she's just like, yeah, sure, whatever. She's there with the agent. And so she just lets him in. Okay. And then as she's leaving, yeah, she gives him the key and asks him to lock the door. Right. As they're leaving. And Nancy's like, okay, well, he just didn't lock the door then. And he came back and he stole the furniture. Gotcha. Duh. Okay. <laughs> but, but she doesn't, she also doesn't know who his name is at first. And Nancy has to go around to like hotels in the area to like ask about this guy. And then eventually finds out that it's Roger Holt. And okay. he's quote unquote antique dealer. But also she checks with Chief McGinnis and Chief McGinnis says he's actually a wanted jewel thief. <laughs> Yeah, from Pennsylvania. Who is also, so I guess it's just using his name, his actual name as right. a known jewel thief to pretend to be an antique dealer, whatever. Right. Yeah. It's weird. And he happens to be, or Chief McGinnis tells him that he happens to be in the same town that the cousin is from anyway. So Nancy's like, well, I guess we're going to Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, but not before she gets a threatening note telling her not to go. So. And, okay, you have to tell me if this happens in your version or not, that Togo gets hit by a car. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I didn't like that. There was, was no totally point. totally unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. So there was this weird drama with Nancy getting upset with Hannah, kind of, because Hannah just let apparently Togo out to just go wander the neighborhood, which, hold on, wait a second. Why? Why? Yeah. Why Hannah would you do that? So I get it. And then Togo gets hit by a car and they don't do anything about it. I mean, Nancy is upset and concerned. He takes him inside or whatever, but he's just, they don't take him to a vet. He just whimpers. She cleans the area and she determines it's not that bad or something. Her beloved pet will be fine. Yeah. How do you know? <laughs> oh. Okay. No, so like we got to add this to the list of not the list of Nancy seals, but I need to start a separate list as to reasons. Nancy flaws. Nancy <laughs> needs a skills list and a flaws list. And a flaw of Nancy is that she never takes animals to the vet when mm-hmm. she needs to take animals to the vet. Forget about that pigeon in Larkspur Lane. She needs to take <laughs> care of her dog. <laughs> For real. For real. Poor Togo. Anyway, sorry, aside. (laughs) The next day, she takes uh, Bess and George with her to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And on the way, they have car trouble. And so they're they're having car trouble. They're stuck on the side of the road. When up starts, they see a girl walking towards them. Turns out her name is Manda Krutz. Krutz? 
I don't know how you say that last name. Kroots. We can say Kroots. I think Kroots. Yeah. Amanda Kroots. Um, and she basically tells her whole life story to Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I'm going back to my parents' house after having run away because my father didn't want me to get an education, but I wanted an education. So I left to go mm-hmm. like work and learn stuff about the world. He wanted her to just stay and work on the family farm until she got married, which she's only 16. Right. But- Yeah, we find out that she is Amish and not house Amish, but what's the other term? Church Amish? Church Amish. Mm -hmm. She is church Amish, which means that her family is very, very conservative um, and doesn't, they don't, they don't, they don't embellish their home or anything. They definitely don't use technology or cars or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And Nancy actually offers to, once she gets her car fixed, take Manda home in her car. But Manda says, no, 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 my father won't like me showing up in a car. So I'll just keep walking or whatever. Another 10 miles home. Right. (laughs) She does lead Nancy to a mechanic that's just a little ways away. And then the mechanic comes and fixes Nancy's car. Nancy's still concerned about Amanda, though. So she decides to drive and try to find the Cruz's farm to check up on her because she's worried that maybe her family won't take her back in, (laughs) which I think is a fair concern. You know, you find like this, what, she's 16, 17 year old girl wandering in the middle of nowhere. You're like, maybe we should just go check. Yeah. (laughs) And if it's not all good, we'll give her a ride somewhere. And, yeah. Uh, but yeah, they do go check and they meet the Kretzes, the parents, and find that she did come home and her dad did say that she could stay, but that the family was basically had to give her the silent treatment, that no one in the family could talk to her, even though she was still permitted in the house. So she leaves again, obviously, because right. she doesn't <laughs> want to be treated that way by her family. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. It's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> but... Poor girl. The Kroots is really not like Nancy for some mm-hmm. reason. Um, Nancy, oh, Nancy saves uh, Mr. Kroots from an angry bull. Yes. <laughs> so I think that has a lot to do with it. And they feed her a lot and or feed all of them a lot. And they let Nancy and Bess and George stay there. And so they promise to try to help find Manda and try to convince her to come home because Mr. Kroots says that, you know, he's sorry and that he, you know, won't actually require his family not to speak to, to her, basically, that he was just upset, I guess. Oh, it's and, horrible. Um, so she's like, okay, I'll try to find her and, and bring her back for you. So the next day they go to a bakery to ask about Manda, if they know where Manda is or where Manda went or whatever. And they say, no, they haven't seen her, but there was a couple that had just moved to the area um, looking for a young Amish girl to come do housework for them. And they mm-hmm. thought that maybe Manda had gone to work for them. Right. All of this happens very fast. She leaves her job, walks home, gets kicked out by her family and then finds a new job all in the span of like a few hours. <laughs> yeah. In, in what is presumably an incredibly rural place like not a lot around pretty much just farms and fields and everything how how lucky (laughs) of this young you know 16 17 year old girl also and I know we're just doing the summary right now but I just have to say do you find it weird that a Nancy Bess and George just drive to this random town without any idea of where they're going to stay when they get there It's very strange. I cannot imagine taking a trip and not even having a hotel in mind of where you want to stay or like a motel or something. You can't just, I know, I know we're in a much different time or whatever, but this is an incredibly rural place. They didn't even look at a phone book or call, call anybody to be like, Hey, do you have a room available or whatever? (laughs) There was none of that. They just happen upon this farm where they're like, oh, yeah, sure, you can stay here. And then eventually they just happen upon another place where they can stay as well. It's just bananas to me. It's just a little too lucky. Yeah. Anyway. This is how people get murdered. So (laughs) don't. For real. Um, Oh, yeah. Then they go see Alpha Zen, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. They go to uh, Alpha Zen's home and slash antique barn where he deals in antiques also. And they look around uh, because Nancy's looking for this stolen furniture and she finds an end table that matches the description of, or actually matches an end table that is currently in Mrs. Tenney's inherited house. (laughs) And it's supposedly previously been owned by George Washington. 
Right. So it's supposed to be really, really valuable in table. And Nancy sees it and is like, aha, you were the one that, that stole this furniture. And he's like, no, I made a replica of it because I liked this table so much. There are actually two real tables, but the person we inherited it from only had one real one. So I made an identical one to match. But we also learn that there is supposedly a secret compartment in one of these tables that has some sort of secret or something inside of it that I guess this thief wanted. So I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't not talk about this because it's just, okay. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I literally don't even know how to, okay. So he shows them the secret compartment that's built into this end table. And of course there's nothing there. Um, and so Nancy obviously thinks, okay, well, you know, the secret must be in the stolen end table that they stole. Mm-hmm. That must be why they were interested in it. And so that must be where the secret is. Except that when eventually we do find the end table at the end, it's not. Like the secret is not in the hidden compartment. Right. It's screwed into the bottom of the table leg. <laughs> it's just kind of wedged in there between the so table and the leg. Why? <laughs> why? Why could why would you not just say well, apparently there's some kind of secret message in one of these end tables. Why do you actually have to build a secret compartment into right. each of them if it's not going to be relevant? And it's not so secret if you're making replicas of this <laughs> table <laughs> that have this compartment as well. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, Nancy tells him about the theft. Uh, after being kind of sneaky, Nancy tells him about the theft of all the furniture from the house that his cousin inherited. Oh, he also inherited too. He had like a stake in it or something. Right. I think they inherited it equally. So right. they just hadn't divided up the furniture yet. Yeah. And so he, you know, is a little upset about this. Like he can't believe that the furniture was stolen or whatever. But, uh, you know, she warns him about it and he says that. It's okay, or, or, or whatever, but mm-hmm. warns him that there may be a thief in the area. Then they decide to go back to the Kruitz's farm, and uh, as they are, someone speeds past them in a car, and then as they round the next corner, there are like a bunch of cinder blocks in the road that Nancy can't avoid hitting, mm-hmm. and so she runs over some of them, and Bess <laughs> smacks her head against the mirror and blacks out. <sighs> Why so much car trouble in this one? (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot of car trouble. It's a lot of Mm -hmm. weird. Basically, I would describe this book as Nancy and a series of unfortunate events orchestrated by Roger Holt. Like, really, that's all it is. It's just, like, just weird occurrences and Roger Holt trying to sabotage her the entire time. That's it. Random accidents. Except for uh, the carriage that overturns. That was just... Oh, right. Just bad luck. off the road. (laughs) Just bad luck. (laughs) Yeah, but we'll get to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so they go back to the Kruitz's farm. Or did you talk about the the note in the cinder box? Oh, no, I had mm-hmm. forgotten. Yes, thank you. So yeah, there was a note attached to uh, one of the cinder blocks that says, Nancy Drew, witches are not welcome in Amish country. So that's kind of uh, spooky, implying that Nancy is a witch. Um, kind of creepy, kind of weird, whatever. Obviously, we know it's from Roger Holt. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> trying to warn Nancy off this case. Nancy is not bothered. Bess, of course, is and is like, I don't like this. We should go <laughs> home. home. Yeah. And Nancy's like, okay, so they go back to the farm where Mrs. Kreutz treats Bess with like liniment oil, but also she does something called um, powwowing. But then after that, Bess is fine. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Bess is she fine. She just takes a little nap. She's okay. Yeah, she's okay. Which also... And we'll talk about this later because Nancy gets a head injury later and then also takes a nap. Don't take a nap after a head injury. <laughs> That's like that research wasn't out yet in the 50s. Rule number one. Oh, goodness. Fall into a coma and not wake up, y'all. Anyway, it's been like two days out of this mystery just for <laughs> head injury naps. So. Seriously, no, seriously, that's not even an exaggeration. That's exactly what happened. Wild goodness. Um, but so, um, Bess recovers and they start telling the Kruitzes about you know this mishap or whatever. And Nancy mentions the note that was left on the cinder block, and the Kruitzes are become immediately just like turned from very friendly to just like very cool and like closed off or whatever, because Nancy was accused of being a witch. Mm -hmm. And so 
the girls are like really off put by this or whatever, but they go to bed. But then the next morning, the crew like still won't talk to them or whatever. So they just leave. <laughs> Probably for the best. Yeah. Really awkward, but um, they're still going to try to find Manda. Um, they still feel responsible for Manda and hopefully still want to help out the Cruces, even though the Cruces were uh, upset. <laughs> right. This is when they, they decide to go find somewhere else to stay. I think they go into maybe into closer to town or into the next town. I can't remember exactly into what they New do. Into New Holland, I think. Okay. So they yeah. do go into the next town and they find a boarding house there with a very nice family that, that lets them stay. Mm-hmm. Even in spite of the witch rumors. so Yes. <laughs> They're called the Glicks. And they um, Nancy asked them about uh, Manda. And they said that they saw Manda riding in a carriage with a couple who seemed to be pretending to be Amish. Mm. Um, they said they were dressed like Amish people, but that they didn't speak like Amish. They spoke like, quote unquote, English people, which means non-Amish in right. in their colloquial terms. So that's interesting. Nancy, of course, immediately assumes that this is Roger Holt. Spoiler alert, it is Roger Holt. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I like that there's no other suspects. No. Like the cousin was almost a suspect and then immediately ruled out the second mm-hmm. Nancy looked into it. Yeah. And honestly, I thought that that would have been a great, like a great kind of trick, like double trick. I almost kind of wanted it to happen is when she goes and she finds the end table and he tells the story of like, yeah, oh yeah, I created this end table. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure you did. But mm-hmm. yeah, he actually did. But I was hoping that it would be kind of like a, a no, he's really pulling one over on Nancy and maybe mm-hmm. he's involved in it somehow. Definitely not. Definitely mm-hmm. just a red herring. Definitely just we just totally move past it. It's just Roger Holt. It's just Roger Holt yeah. the whole time. We have no other suspects and Nancy's just like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's Roger Holt. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, Nancy kind of has this bright idea that if he's pretending to be Amish and riding in a carriage, that he must have gotten a care and, and that he just came to the area. He must have purchased or got a carriage from somewhere. And a horse. And a horse. And we do find out that he had stolen a carriage. <laughs> and so Nancy kind of finds out that way. And then Nancy decides to go back to Alpha Zins to kind of, I guess, update her address with him, which is what she said, in case he wanted to contact her for some oh, reason. Yeah, I think they were going to go back to see if there's any updates, if they'd heard anything about Roger right. or about Amanda, just because <laughs> he can't contact her now that they've been right. kicked out of the other place that he thought they were staying at. So Yeah, and and so before, so right as she gets in there, though, basically he like jumps on her and he's like, oh, I sold all of this furniture and also the end table that you were really interested in the other day. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, okay, you know, interesting. But she tells him this is probably Roger Holt. And because apparently he paid like a bunch of big bills or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Nancy's like, can I see the bills that he paid you with? Nancy looks at the bills, is able to determine herself that they are counterfeit. Mm-hmm. Excellent uh, <laughs> counterfeit detecting skills there, Nancy. Put that I, on the list. <laughs> I did. I added it to the list of yes. Nancy skills. And um, they call the police who confirm this and uh, take a report. Uh, basically put an APB out on Roger Holt, the Roger Holt's in the area. Mm-hmm. At this point, Nancy is accused of being a witch again. Does somebody come in and tell them to go look in, in Nancy's car no, so I don't know. I don't know in your version oh. what happens, but in mine, they're just they're eating dinner with them or whatever, and then they go upstairs to like look at Mrs. Zinn's quilts, quilting or whatever. Oh, okay. And while they're up there, Alpha Zinn comes into the house and he's all angry because he saw hidden lamps in Nancy's backseat. I don't think anybody told him about it. Oh, okay. I think he just saw that they were they were hidden back there. Oh, I think that they were still in in the furniture store, I guess. And his wife comes in and says that she'd gotten news of Nancy being a witch and then was told, I guess, on his way out, Roger Holt grabbed some of the lamps from the antique store, saw Nancy was coming in, waited, put them in her car, and then went back and told, I guess, his wife, hey, go check in the car because you're going to find stolen property because she's a witch and she moved the the lamps without ever having left the store. But interesting, interesting. Yeah, in 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 the earlier edition, Nancy's not it's not called a witch in this scenario. She's just accused of being a thief. 
Oh, okay. Which her being a witch doesn't really come up with Alpha Zinn. He's still, of course, really upset with her or whatever, even though Mrs. Zinn kind of tries to like interfere and be like, no, Nancy's a nice girl or whatever. And, but Nancy is incredibly offended by it. And so are George and Bess. And they're like, mm. this is Nancy Drew. Do you even know what Nancy is doing for this community? How kind dare of- you? <laughs> and um, they kind of like leave in a little bit of a self-righteous huff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, no mention of her being a witch. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, he kicks her out basically after this. Um, so they go back to the Glick's house and some visitors show up for them. Interesting. Was that in yours as well? Well, yes, eventually, but not yet. Um, Oh, I might've skipped over some things. Okay. My notes aren't exactly. Okay. Do they go to the market day with Mrs. Glick and your, or not, yeah, with Mrs. Glick and your version? Yes, they do. I don't remember if that was before or after the dance, but. Yeah, in my, yeah, it's before. Yeah, so they go into the market day with Mrs. Glick and they um, come across someone in the street that they think is Manda. Oh, oh, yes, yes. But I'm with like, you now. Okay, but coming up to her, they realize that it's not, it's just someone who looks a lot like Manda, turns out to be her cousin, mm-hmm. Melinda, which, come on, I think maybe you could have pick just like a little bit more of a different name, Manda and Melinda. They're not twins, whatever. Mm -hmm. Her cousin Melinda. And they're like, oh, have you seen Manda? And she's like, no, I haven't. But someone did mistake me for Manda, just like you did the other day. And they basically, they told her to hurry up and get back to the schnitz because Nancy drew the witch girls coming. Mm -hmm. And she was really confused by this. And eventually he realized that that wasn't Manda. I was like, oh, sorry, never mind. (laughs) Um, But so now, so she's told Nancy that apparently Manda is supposed to be at this place called the schnitz. Um, which she's not really sure what it means because schnitzing or like schnitz is supposed to have to do with like the apple drying process. And she doesn't even really know what, where that would be or or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Nancy's like, okay, well, thanks, whatever. But then they also see at the same time or like right after that, they see a black carriage that they think is the Holtz carriage. And, you know, they start to try to chase after it, but zooms off. And then they try to tell the police about it. The police is like, I can't leave my beat, which I think is the first time in history that a (laughs) cop has ever said no to Nancy Drew. Mm -hmm. But they're like, okay, oh, well, we can't catch up to the carriage now. Anyway, and so they just let that go, basically. (laughs) Whatever, let's leave. Oh, sorry. Yes. They get back to the Glick's house. She asks Mr. Glick about the schnitz and he says, yeah, there used to be like an apple drying barn or something somewhere at some point. I don't really know where it is, but it's, it's somewhere in the area. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, cool. Great. <laughs> Not really helpful, but whatever. Um, and then, and then yes, Ned, Dave and Bert come to visit. The girl for, for all of like 24 hours. Yeah. But yeah. They're told of like a barn dance at a, a nearby farm. So they decide to, to go as couples to this dance. And that's when we have the carriage crash. Yeah. Ned decides he's going to hire a carriage, an old fashioned carriage for him and Nancy to take to the dance. Mm. And as they're on their way to the dance, there's like this, these, like teenagers and other carriages that are racing and they overtake them too quickly and their wheels bump and it knocks them over on the side of the road. So Bess and George and Dave and Bert are all at the dance waiting for Ned and Nancy to arrive. And then when they don't arrive within a certain time period, they're like, okay, something's wrong. We have to go looking for them. Yeah. Then we get like this kind of really weird interlude where Mm. it's kind of told simultaneously what, Bess, Bert, Dave, and uh, George are all doing and what Nancy and Ned are doing at the same time. So apparently Nancy and Ned have, um, they're fine. Of course they're fine after the crash. They're a little a little shaken up or whatever, but basically they're <laughs> absolutely fine. They end up going to the dance where they saw a carriage full of uh, the furniture mm-hmm. and they waited around to see if anybody would come up to the carriage. They saw a guy come up to the carriage who had been apparently been scoping out the dance, 
which they were like, oh, he was probably looking for <laughs> me. Yeah. Like. And so they end up following him. He takes the carriage and they end up following him because they're trying to see where, I guess, his hideout is or whatever. Mm. So they follow him on a horse and he eventually realizes he's being followed and like bails out of the carriage and just abandons it. So Nancy is able to drive the carriage back to someone's house and they call the police and are like, Hey, we recovered all this stolen furniture. And then they go back to the dance again to mm -hmm. meet up with their friends who mm -hmm. have been pretty much just like back and forth a bajillion times trying to find them. <laughs> it was so yeah. weird. I I have to say that like, so they go, they, <laughs> Pre cell phone life, I'm telling you. <laughs> they they're like, oh, what if they were injured? And so, well, maybe they went, maybe they went back to the Glick's house. So they go to the Glick's house. They're not the Glick's house. They're like, okay, well, maybe they were fine, and they ended up going back to the dance to look for us there. They go back to the dance. They're not at the dance yet. They're like, okay, well, maybe they did go back to the Glick's house. Maybe they're there now, and we should go back to the Glick's house to check again. And so they did that. And then I think one of the boys, I think it's like uh, Bert or something, says, I have no idea where to look for them. And it's like, hold on. You've looked in two places. <laughs> Maybe you should look at the scene of the accident. Yeah. They never go to the scene of the accident. I don't understand it. If you're worried that your friend is injured and dying somewhere... Like maybe, maybe find the route that they were taking. Yes. If this were Nancy Drew, Nancy would have been there in two seconds. She would have deduced that there were tracks off to the into the field or whatever and would have followed them. But these people don't even know to go look at the scene of the accident. <laughs> I got to say, I, you know, sometimes I, we're hard on Nancy for being like, okay, well, obviously that's what you should do, Nancy. But apparently... <laughs> Some of this stuff isn't obvious to other people, or at least wasn't at the time. So maybe Nancy really is, you know, just above and beyond everyone else. She must be. <laughs> oh, anyway. So funny. But they do but all end up, yeah, yeah, back at the dance, right? And then somebody yeah. bursts in and starts accusing Nancy of being a witch. But she handles it very well. And people are like, oh, that's the girl who's looking for Amanda. So it's okay. She's fine. Yeah, Nancy apparently at this point is incredibly tired or something. And she's all like, oh, I don't want to deal with the angry mob. <laughs> and then kind of like comes to a rescue and is like, this is Nancy Drew. Akin, similar to what Bess and George did with Alpha Zen when he was all upset with her. He was like, do you know she just recovered a carriage full of stolen furniture and there's this thief in your area that she is desperately looking for trying to save a local girl from his clutches or whatever and everybody's like oh and oh oh, oh our, our bad sorry <laughs> um and and then they're all cool they're all cool with her after that yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah truly bizarre but then they go home uh, or go to back to the Glicks. And is this when? Yes. So then <laughs> the boys leave the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and then the girls go to investigate the spot where the carriage stopped. Like where he bailed out of the carriage where he realized that he was being followed and left. Because Nancy thought that he was, you know, on his way back to his hideout. And she wanted to see if she could find out where it was. So right. she... Goes, they go back to that scene and she kind of they kind of go deeper into the woods following trails or whatever. They come into like this clearing where there's like this little house that's kind of, you know, run down or whatever. And George gets sucked into a sinkhole. It's like quicksand, but dirt. I didn't really get this. They said they thought maybe a sluice way had been there. Some sort of some sort of place where they got water previously, but it got filled in. And so now it's just like a big pit and George falls in. Yep. Yeah. yeah. George just is basically like, help me. She's like sinking into the ground um, and they are able to get her out. Then they go into the house to investigate the house and there's nothing really in the house, but then of course there's someone hiding in the attic mm -hmm. who dumps a bunch of newspapers on top of them yeah. or something and mm -hmm. is able to escape. While they're dealing with that, yeah. I guess. Nancy tries to open the, the door to the attic and they just throw it all over her. So they're <laughs> covered in dust and newspapers and he makes his escape. Um, but then Nancy decides to go investigate the attic and she finds an old Bible that once belonged to uh, Rachel Holt. Mm -hmm. Seemingly, I guess, apparently related to Roger Holt, of mm -hmm. course. 
and they decide to keep that. And they go back to the Glicks to try to kind of investigate a little bit more about the property. Oh, and they, they find the witch tree on the property as well. Oh, right, right. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. They find a witch tree. Oh, yeah. The witch tree. Just well, I guess a- it is the witch tree. And he was painting the symbol on it later. Yeah, whatever. Yes. Yeah. And then they decide to, to leap to go find out more about the property from the Glicks. But then on the way, they decide to stop at the Kreutz's farm to try to see if Manda has returned. And, of course, she hasn't. But they... Uh, are able to talk to Mrs. Kreutz, who um, says that she knows an old man who probably knows or can probably tell them uh, where the Schnitz is, Mm -hmm. um, because that might be where Amanda is. And so they decide to go to this old man and ask him about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they find him and he explains where the Schnitz probably is, that there used to be one on the Holt property, that the Holtz owned a very very large farm and there were multiple houses on this property for different generations of the family. So they're Mm -hmm. pretty much in the right place already. And this is where quote unquote gypsy has come into the story. Yes. This was really bizarre. It was really strange. I will say, so um, gypsy can be an offensive term for some people. So I won't use that anymore, but, uh, He's traveler, Is traveler that- or Romani, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, this is a truly, a truly bizarre um, addition to the story. It just seemed kind of shoehorned in there, mm-hmm. um, but apparently, so on the old Holt property, um, at one point, a group of travelers came to stay there and Mr. Holt was incredibly upset about this and tried to kick them off or whatever, but they just went to go live on another part of his property in the woods. Mm -hmm. And apparently Mr. Holt's children would still occasionally visit the travelers and his oldest son fell in love with uh, a fortune teller there. And of course, Mr. Holt was furious about this or whatever and forbid them to marry. He said he would disinherit his son if he married this girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, the girl tries to convince him to let them marry because she says if he lets them marry, she'll tell him the secret of all how his family has disappeared. Oh, did we talk about the curse? <laughs> no, but they didn't really talk about the curse until this point either. So, no. so apparently the Holtz property is like cursed or there's, uh, he, he says it's, I think he says it's cursed and he tries to warn the girls off of going there. He says, don't go there. People disappear there. Mm -hmm. And apparently several members of the Holtz family, I guess a lot of their children or whatever, had gone missing just from this property randomly. And so this um, fortune teller girl says she will tell Mr. Holt how his family disappeared if, if he lets her marry his son, which... This is just seems like a really messed up situation <laughs> to me. <laughs> All of it's really messed up. You know, the xenophobia from Mr. Holt, but also like the weird threat of like, I know what happened to your family and I'm not going to tell you unless you <laughs> let me marry your son. Like, girl, I wouldn't let you marry my son either. If, that's what you, if you're like that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But whatever. But he doesn't budge, Mr. Holt. And so she writes down this secret on a piece of paper and hides it in a piece of old furniture that, you know, supposedly belonged to George Washington, a.k.a., you know, our end tables. Right. (laughs) So that's how it all fits together. And that's why these tables are supposedly so valuable to Roger Holt, because it's got this secret about why his family members kept going missing a hundred years ago or whatever. So, so bizarre. It's so short shoehorned in just to give it more significance because this antique table is not enough of a prize to, to steal. It has to have some sort of extra layer to it, I guess. But right. it's, I find it weird because it, the whole book, it like, we're trying to uh, create like the spookiness around like Nancy being cursed and Nancy being accused as being a witch to then kind of shoehorn in this like weird you know mysticism surrounding you know Romani people like right it just seems like a total shift like if you're trying to go from witches to that like that that's two different two yeah. different themes we've got you know like you should pick one or the other mm-hmm. um, so yeah it was it was bizarre but that's the story it gets and- more bizarre from there but we'll <laughs> 
So they then they go back to the Glicks, and Bess gets a telephone call from. Oh. This was this was pretty sinister. She gets mm-hmm. a telephone call from Carson's secretary, mm-hmm. who tells Bess that apparently Carson, Nancy's dad, is now deathly ill in the hospital, and that she needs to rush home to go see him. So Bess communicates this to Nancy. Nancy is, of course, incredibly upset about this, is kind mm-hmm. of like in a daze, starts to go upstairs to pack. Um, but it's George who says, like, hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a second. This doesn't make sense. Why would his secretary call for Bess? Right. If anyone was calling, it would be Hannah. And also, Bess has never spoken to Mr. Drew's secretary before, Mm -hmm. so she wouldn't know that that's who was calling. So George thinks, mentions to Nancy, like, hey, I don't think this is legit. And she calls her parents to Mm -hmm. say, hey, is Mr. Drew okay? And they're like, yeah, we literally just talked to him five minutes ago. He's fine. Mm -hmm. And, (laughs) And Nancy's like, oh, thank goodness. You know, I'm so glad that you thought of that, George. Like, Mm -hmm. I, you know, that would have been. That must have just been Roger Holt trying to mess with me. What a sinister ruse. Yeah, it's gross. It's really, really gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Nancy, Nancy is certainly really affected by it. And I think like that's, I think that's one of the most, that's the most taken in like I've ever seen Nancy. Oh yeah. She's distraught over this. Understandably so. Understandably so. But like, Oh, throughout all of, you know, all of the tricks that people have tried to play on her, all the hoaxes that she has uncovered, she normally has like an underlying layer of suspicion. This, nothing. She just immediately, she was about to drop everything to go home to her dad because it, it was a really convincing con. And of course, like, why would she take a moment to to reconsider that? She wasn't thinking about anything except trying to make it to her dad mm-hmm. in time to see him. And see, there's even, yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's gross. tough. But thank goodness he's okay. He's fine. Right. And then Nancy discovers that her car has been stolen from the Glick's garage. Well, first. Oh, am I jumping ahead? <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit because I just want to make sure that this part gets in. Oh. The next day, Henner, the Glick's son, shoots Nancy in the back of her head with a slingshot. And she, of course, blacks out for a long time, too. And so this is our second head injury of the book so mm-hmm. far. Mrs. Glick treats Nancy in a similar way to uh, Mrs. Kreutz, except that a doctor does come out to examine Nancy yes. <laughs> and says she'll be okay with rest. And so she takes a nap. Oh. <laughs> and then is, you know, fine the next day. But like, geez, Louise, geez, Louise, again. And then, yeah, the next day they find out that Nancy's convertible has been stolen. <laughs> And Nancy, of course, wants to go back to the Holtz property to investigate that more. And so she asks Mrs. Glick if she can take their carriage out there. And Mrs. Glick says yes, as long as she and Henner can go with her. Mm -hmm. And so they start to go with Nancy and with Bess and George out to the property. And then Henner is driving (laughs) the carriage for some reason. 10-year-old boy. boy. (laughs) Um, And he, they get into kind of like this track or whatever and the wheel of the carriage pops off Mm -hmm. and it's broken and they can't fix it and they have to go to a neighbor's farm to ask to borrow their carriage Mm -hmm. (laughs) and while they're there there happens to be a barn raising going on and nancy saves henner and another little boy from a construction accident Mm -hmm. (laughs) a beam falls and she just narrowly pushes them out of the way and saves herself as well right Way to go, Nancy. Yeah. Supporting her skill of saving small children from accidents. In 99 Steps, she she saves the little boy who's like falling off a statue. Oh, yeah. In Password to Lark's Brew Lane, she saves a little girl who falls into the water. And, you know, now in uh, the witch tree symbol, she saves two little boys from getting smushed by some wall, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And then, you know, the obviously the family that their neighbors are so grateful to this. They give Nancy a, a full cake, a dozen donuts, fried chicken, and a gallon of lemonade mm-hmm. just to go. Yep. Just take this and take our <laughs> carriage. Thank you for saving our son's life. <laughs> then they continue on their way back to the Holtz property to try to investigate more. Mm-hmm. So... 
it's just it's just so random and I like literally like as I'm saying it, I'm like this makes no sense like trying to summarize it it makes no sense but they go so they go to the to the property and they see the witch tree and there's like a hand painting a symbol the witch tree symbol mm-hmm. on the witch tree and it turns out to be this boy who is mute and and deaf, deaf. as well yeah yeah so they go somewhere else to start looking for Manda. Is that right? Well, so they leave the Glicks with that boy to kind of watch him, I guess, or make sure that he... Somebody even suggests like tying him up and leaving him in the carriage while they're looking around so they know he can't get anywhere. Kind of concerning. But, you know, Nancy kind of vetoes that. She's like, no, no, no. I think he's okay. We'll just... You guys stay here. Keep an eye on him. And we're going to go investigate this larger main house Mm -hmm. uh, on another part of the property and so they go in and they find manda right Mm -hmm. so um they find manda and manda tells them like oh yes you know i've been working for the holtz here or whatever they've just moved here from ohio and you know and they're fixing up this house they just you know got this house Uh, that's why all this furniture is here Mm -hmm. you know we're going to renovate and then we're going to put the furniture in it so they're basically lying to manda about all the stolen antique furniture or whatever Mm -hmm. um but nancy asks manda basically tells manda oh no this guy's a criminal you're being you're being taken in uh you're taken as a fool and you Mm -hmm. need to get out of here with us or whatever, but we want to see the furniture first. Right. (laughs) And so Amanda takes them up to the attic to investigate the furniture. Nancy finds the end table. And then Roger Holt comes home early and locks them in the attic. Right. It's really, I kind of don't want to move forward without talking about this moment because it is pretty sinister. He just leaves them there to die. He does, but he also said, like he says, so Nancy is like, okay, great. We found the furniture, you know, let's get out of here and tell the police or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then the Holt, Mr. Holt comes in and is like, you will never do that. You will die first. Mm-hmm. So he, 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 he literally says, basically, you're going to die. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to kill you, which I think like we get, obviously we're, we're in the same kinds of threatening situations in other books, but I don't think any of the villains have ever been this explicit like saying they're going to kill them. Right. Got really close to that, I think, in Clue in the Leaning Chimney. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. When she's in the kiln and the the bad guy's locker in the kiln. I think mm-hmm. we get kind of close to that. But even then, they are just saying, like, you'll be knocked out or you'll be crushed or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. they don't stay killed. He says, you're going to die. Mm-hmm. It's a lot for a children's bug. Yeah, I thought it was pretty intense. Intense, intense imagery. <laughs> yeah, we don't really do murders in Nancy Drew. She never even investigates murders. It's all nonviolent, mostly, but yeah, yeah, very intense. So he locks them in there to die. And they are a little, I think they're a little dramatic about it, honestly. Yeah. Or George or Bess or so. She's like, oh, I'm going to suffocate in here or whatever. And it's like, Calm down. Yeah. This is not an airtight room. It right. might be a little stuffy, but you're going to be okay. <laughs> There's even like a ventilator on the wall. And George is like, if you feel faint, come stand next to me next to the <laughs> ventilator for fresh air. So, oh, I think you're okay. Just have a seat. You're, you're like, all right. right, ladies. But so they wait until it gets dark and they find a lantern and they start signaling, taking turns signaling SOS mm-hmm. out the window, which is a great skill. I would, you know tell everybody (laughs) we're an SOS anyway so they do that and then they're rescued by two cops who come in and are able to save them Mm -hmm. because luckily apparently they were in the area investigating the Holtz property because they thought you know hey maybe Roger Holt is here on his family's old property yeah (laughs) which you could have started there a long time ago, gentlemen, and maybe this would have been solved like five days ago. Right. Like, <laughs> Before Nancy was accused of being a witch and all this, oh, this drama happened. Oh but, my gosh. But before the police get there, Nancy uses her time in captivity oh, right. to to find the secret compartment or not, not secret compartment, but find the secret note that's hidden in the, the end table. Yep. 
Yeah, turns out that, yeah, like we said, it wasn't hidden in the hidden compartment. It was just screwed into the table leg. Mm -hmm. Nancy just had to unscrew the leg and then pull the paper out. It's just so frustrating. (laughs) Yeah, they find this secret note, which um, is from the young Romani fortune teller Mm -hmm. who, to her true love, it's, it's supposed to be very romantic, but I just thought it was weird. Where she says that there is basically just a hole on the property that she fell into once or her brother did or something. She fell in, but her brother was thankfully there to pull her out. And that's the only reason she survived where the the other family members died because they fell in the hole. That I guess is the same one George was in earlier. Yeah, but inside the hole is a crystal cave that will make him so much money one day. Will it? What? (laughs) What? Okay. So many levels of implausibility. (laughs) And it's just random. It's just so random. So first of all, we get this entire thing set in Amish country, Mm -hmm. which feels pretty random. It takes up the whole book. So after a while, you're like, okay, fine. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm with you. Then we get to the witchiness, which is like, well, that's kind of weird that, you know, I guess Amish people are could could potentially be uh, superstitious. So, okay, I'm still following. Then you get to quote unquote gypsies and it's like, no, totally lost me. And then we get to crystal cave. What? What? It also absolutely has no bearing on any of the rest of it. Right. Like it could have been, it could have just been a hole in the property. It could have just been a hole on the property. Been like, Hey, by the way, there's this dangerous hole. Don't go over there. Right. <laughs> Maybe mark it off or something so it doesn't happen to any of the rest of the family. Well, so she she says that she planted some bushes there. So oh, that okay. That's right. He would know where it was and that he wouldn't fall into it. Did she just oh. find his relatives, like, skeletons down there or something? I, and... mean, I guess so. I mean, uh. like... They don't really talk about that. But if she fell in the hole and she knows that's where everyone disappeared to... There's got to be evidence for that, at least right. to some extent. That's horrifying. That's, yeah, pretty freaking morbid. Yeah. Pull me out of, brother, pull me out of this hole in the ground full of human remains of his family. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Mm-hmm. It's very Ugh. creepy. Yeah. It's creepy, but at the same time, it's creepy, but at the same time, it's absolutely unaffected. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't understand how they could take something that is really so traumatic and just absolutely have it be like, well, okay, like <laughs> just just like mm, I don't really understand why I'm reading this right now. Mm-hmm. So I yeah yeah that's pretty much that's pretty much the book. I mean, yeah. later you know they eventually find the Holtzes at driving in Nancy's car. Nancy's car is returned, and apparently he has like this confession to the police that is kind of relayed to Nancy from another police officer. It's kind mm. of strange, but that's that's really pretty much it. Oh, well, we do have the scene at the end where Nancy takes Manda home to her family, and on the way there, she announces that oh, I met a nice boy. In Lancaster, and I'm marrying him right. next month. I hope you'll all come to the wedding. And Nancy's like, I'd love to be at your wedding. What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if in, in your book or not, but they definitely, they make a lot of references to Amanda getting married throughout it. Like, um, you know, they say, oh, well, she's at the age to get married or, oh, she's so, so young and she's such a good worker. She's so beautiful or whatever. I'm sure she'll find a husband in no time. And so they just they just make a lot of reference to that. And so it's like, okay, I guess I guess this is how we come full circle with Manda or whatever. But yeah, it's just annoying. It's just annoying. I guess it's supposed to be because Nancy can't get married, you know, marriage for Nancy would be the kiss of death that it it's happy it, we can have a happy ending if we make another character get married, you know. Right. Well, it <laughs> Just marriage seems like a weird theme throughout this. They did have a lot of references to Nancy getting married. Like they would be like, Oh, why aren't you married yet? You're more than old enough. Like, what are yeah. you doing? Are you going to have your own like quilt party to, to make your, <laughs> yeah. your box full yeah. of dowry stuff? Yeah. And Mrs. Glick, even she says like, Oh, Ned Bird and Dave, they were such nice young men. Why don't you guys marry them? <laughs> And Beth even says, she's like, oh, yes, they are. They are nice boys, but we're not ready to get married yet. Right. So even Beth is like, no. (laughs) 
Or the the joke with uh, I don't know if you had this in your book as well, but the joke with Ned about the carriages. Yes. Oh, yes. I love that moment. And mm-hmm. I had written down to talk about it too, where Nancy tells Ned that they'll have to get an open carriage and not a closed carriage because mm. closed carriages are only for married right. couples. Right. And Ned says he'd love to get a closed carriage with Nancy one day. Mm-hmm. And and Nancy pretends to not know what he means. <laughs> He's like, you know, as soon as I graduate from college, I want to start buying a ring and like, ah. <laughs> and Nancy's like, mm, I don't know, you know, just blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't get that. <laughs> Even though she totally does. She, she just totally explained does. it to him. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It seemed like to me that this book was a way for a book in the 1950s to kind of do like a fun old timey episode. You know what I mean? (laughs) And for modern readers reading books written in the 1950s, like to us, which was old timey, Mm -hmm. trying to read a 1950s book that was trying to be old timey in the 1950s was really weird. It (laughs) It felt very strange. It felt like, one, it felt random. There was a lot of random elements to it. Two, it felt like Nancy, who we see as an old-fashioned character, being a progressive person. Right. And not that Nancy isn't progressive occasionally, like, you know, throughout the series. I think she definitely is portrayed that way. But, like, being, like, centuries ahead of Mm -hmm. people that she's interacting with. And, yeah, it was just really, it was really kind of jarring. Mm -hmm. It's very strange. Anyway. So going back through, I did not think it was interesting. So it, so in addition to all the marriage talk, there was a lot of talk about food. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, of course, <laughs> anytime we talk about food, it's just a golden opportunity to fat shame Beth. Oh, yeah. And so that was that was literally almost it was almost more than 99 steps. Like where it seemed like they fat shamed Bess just by every chapter, there seemed to be more fat shamey Bess in Witch Tree Symbol. The they were talking about how uh, Mrs. Crutes had served them like this really big meal or whatever, and of course Bess loved it, and of course Bess would love it. Uh-huh. You know, Bess loves food. And then after they leave, Bess starts talking about you know when are we going to eat lunch or whatever, and they're like, Bess, you don't deserve lunch. You just had such a large breakfast or whatever. I don't think that that was in mine. I've, I noticed a little bit less of the the fat shaming on for this one. So maybe they wrote a little bit out of it in between versions here. But I actually yeah. noticed when they first introduced Bess, they just described her as pretty blonde. They don't throw plump in there from the initial. So I was like, yes, it's going to be not as bad. But then we do have a few bits where it's like, oh, Bess liked the food. But everyone liked the food because it was so good. Interesting. Did you get the weighing scene in yours? The weighing scene. Oh my <gasps> gosh! What happened? Okay. So they're they're at Alpha Zinn's barn, and I think this is the second time they go. Nancy is like talking to Alpha Zinn about the counterfeit money. I think she's like in his office with him talking about the counterfeit money. And while they're doing that, Bess and George are like out in the barn, secretly weighing themselves on a scale in the barn. This did not you happen didn't... in this version. Oh, okay. um, uh, let me let me find let me find the exact page number. So Mrs. Zinn had served them a meal and a short while after they finished eating, George caught Bess secretly weighing herself on a scale in the barn. Peering over her cousin's shoulder, she exclaimed, Bess Marvin, you've gained five pounds since you left home. Bess was embarrassed momentarily, but insisted that George also get on the scale. The girl with the tomboyish figure was aghast at the weight that she too had put on. If this keeps up, she said chuckling, I'll have to go out in the fields and walk behind a horse-drawn plow for two solid hours to lose the extra pounds. Oh, no. Yeah. No. Yep. Yep. One, it's completely normal to have your your average body weight, like fluctuate five, seven pounds in a single week. And then go back down. Like, that's not a big deal. It's not, it doesn't mean you've gained five pounds in a weekend. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, that's also just really sad that they're thinking of it this way. Yeah. The super gross part is that George automatically comes in and starts policing Bess's weight for Mm -hmm. her. But then, yeah, the fact that both of them are incredibly self-conscious about their weight and upset about the fact that they gained, you know, a few pounds while mm-hmm. they're 
you know, traveling and eating a lot of really good food. Like, yeah, the fact that they feel so upset they have to like weigh themselves and talk about immediately going out to like exercise to lose the weight. Mm -hmm. It's sad. It's like a punishment as well for, for having eaten and food's not a reward. It's just, it's food. You should eat it. Not because you did X number of hours of exercise or whatever that day. Right. That's so sad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff like that in this version. So I find it interesting that, yeah, you didn't notice it as much. So I do hope that it was an edit that they made that Mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, let's, let's take this out. And I was going to look too, to see if they called Bess Plum in mine when they introduced her. Cause I feel like they did, but maybe I'm just, they do. Um, they do call yeah, Mrs. Tenny Plump. Oh, they do. They do. They say best blonde haired, blue eyed and pretty though slightly overweight. Oh yeah. Yeah. They call, they also call Hannah Plump in this one. Mm. And of course there's a lot of fat shaming Alpha Zen. Did you get that? Mm-hmm. And yours, yeah, they call him a roly poly, mm-hmm. uh, which is really upsetting. And Mrs. Tenney, of course, Mrs. Tenney calls him that. And then Nancy echoes that when she eventually meets him. She's like, Oh, I understand why Mrs. Tenney said that, <sighs> which uh. is, yeah, which is upsetting of our Nancy. Don't participate in it, Nancy. Don't do Don't. it. Yeah. In general, in addition to the fat shaming, I did feel like there's weird emphasis put on, and this, I guess, is a little bit of a different tone, but there was like weird emphasis put on the um, Amish appearance. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, it was different to, you know, Nancy, Bess, and George. And so that's why they were remarking on it. And that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But they made it a point to like, call out like how healthy they looked and like how strong and healthy Mm -hmm. and we Amish like little meat on our women's bones or something yeah. weird statement like that. And, and w- especially when they meet, I think when they meet the Glick's children, Henner and um, I forget their daughter's name, she specifically remarks, Oh, what beautiful children and how healthy looking. Mm. Is that not a weird thing to remark about other people's children being healthy? Like you're surprised that someone takes care of their children. Oh, look, they don't look malnourished and like they're wasting yeah. away. Like, Oh, yeah, that is weird. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, is it a conception or was it a conception of Amish people that they because they were so I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but like old timey, I can't think of a different word for old fashioned, right? Because they're so traditional, you know, traditional, right? Mm-hmm. There we go in the way that they prepare food and they farm and stuff that mm-hmm. you expected them to be malnourished. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't, yeah, I don't understand. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah. They do call Miss Tenney or Mrs. Tenney plump upon introducing her. It's like the first sentence of the book. And I was like, well, I guess Bess is in this first scene because <laughs> <laughs> it's not Bess. So I'm a little grateful for that. But then we still have this, this comment about this neighbor. So yeah, they call her plump and nervous. <laughs> Which so it's like it was literally it could have been it could have been best in any other. <laughs> just like well, we can't have another best start. We can't have another best start. So we might as well introduce another character who is exactly like Bess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Poor to just Bess. The Bess. I know. My gosh. And there's a drawing of her. She even looks tiny in the drawing. So of course, of course, she does. I don't know if you have the same illustrations in yours. No. So in the older ones, there are much less illustrations. I only get like, I think probably two or three in the whole book. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's like one at the very beginning and then there's like two or three without. And that's really like it. Cool. Oh, okay. So we we have to talk about how they describe Ned, Bird, and Dave again. Oh, yes. <laughs> because, okay, I'm just going to read it because I feel like that's the best. that's the best way to, to start it. So the boys are driving up and this is how they introduce them. Um, Just pulling to a stop in an attractive cream colored convertible, which by the way, do they all drive convertibles? Really? They must. Um, (laughs) Were Nancy's friend, Ned Nickerson, Bert Edelton, who often dated George Mm -hmm. and Bess's friend, Dave Evans. So Ned and Dave are friends. Bert is George's date. Mm-hmm. But not the none of them are boyfriends. They're just no. dates at best. But not but not even like Dave is, is a friend and even Ned 
is a friend. Mm -hmm. They don't even say that Ned dated Nancy, which I just think that's just so weird. Like, especially at this point in number 33, well, like we've had, we've had Ned since uh, Clue in the Diary, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Book seven, seven, I believe. Yeah. And so like that we've had about 30 books almost of Ned, you know, coming in and out and going on several dates with Nancy. And dropping marriage hints. Dropping marriage hints <laughs> and still only getting classification of friend. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like that does Ned so dirty. <laughs> Nancy's not allowed to date or get married, though. A rule set by the author, not by, yeah. you know, Nancy or her family. But Of course, of course, of course. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, Nancy's not ready for marriage. And apparently, and, and it's, you know, that's great and fine. Of course, she's 18. Mm -hmm. But it's like, <laughs> at this point, when you've got on multiple dates with Ned, you're certainly not really seeing anybody else. You won't even call him the same way that you call Bert, uh, someone who occasionally dates Nancy or often dates Nancy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even get that title. Mm -hmm. Someone who wants to marry Nancy. Wild. Yeah. Wild stuff. Poor Ned. Oh, so something I wanted to talk about, and this is something that I've noticed kind of across a lot of the books that we've read, is the way they use the word fine, the meaning mm. of the word fine, as in like, that's fine, mm. doesn't mean like it, it means for us today, like I would assume like that's okay. Like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, that sounds fine, whatever, that's fine. When Nancy says it, she means like, oh, that's really great. Or that mm -hmm. sounds really wonderful or whatever. Yeah. So like, oh, that's fine. Like that means something entirely different. And I just thought that that was so interesting because mm -hmm. like Ned talks about hiring the carriage and Nancy says that's fine. And she means like, that sounds like a really good idea. Yeah. Not, okay, sure, fine, whatever. Yeah, whatever she you means, want. That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is strange. I didn't so, even pick up on yeah. that. I thought that was a, a a weird thing. Like, why had why did that change? Mm -hmm. Because, like, when you think about it, like, it makes sense. Like, the word "fine" could mean of good quality, right? Like, right. if something is finely made, it is you know really well made or mm. you know, fine really dining, beautiful. right? Mm. Like, really high quality. So, how did that turn into what we think of it today as, as just acceptable, <laughs> just okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a little funny 50s slang. That's not the only one in there. The yeah. um and the hypers and Oh yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I'll never get over um. Um that was so yummy. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I did want to say that too. So what I found interesting is that so you know, a lot of the times we get Nancy, you know, not going to the police with you know, certain clues or hunches or ideas or whatever. But in this book, she kind of gave a reason that she didn't want to go to the police because she didn't want to bother them. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to send them on a wild goose chase, right. right? If whatever it was didn't pan out, like if the clue didn't pan out to be legit. So and I thought that was interesting because I hadn't seen that before. Nancy never really gives a reason or I hadn't seen Nancy give a reason as to why she didn't give information to the police but she gives one here and i think honestly i think it makes the most sense yeah out of out of everything that i've seen so far because a lot of the times it feels like nancy why don't you go to the police like it seems like they could probably just help you out with this a little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> but i feel like this is a this is a legit it seems like a legitimate reason right that she doesn't want to overtax the police because they could have limited resources and also, you know, she doesn't want to, like, waste their time. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't want to accidentally implicate Manda in anything. If the Holtz were arrested and she happened to be there, she wanted her away yeah. from them before anything like that went down. Yeah. Yeah. Aside from the absolute randomness of the plot, the structure of Nancy's detectiving felt like it felt like it made more sense to me. Yes. Than it mm -hmm. did in others, if that makes any sense. It does. Yeah. Although she does send the police on plenty of wild goose chases in other stories. So I don't understand her hesitancy here, but there, there is good reasoning behind it. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, she did already tell them, you know, about the stolen furniture. She told them that she thinks it was Roger Holt, that she thinks Roger Holt stole her car, that she thinks Roger Holt is in the area and that they mm -hmm. should be on the lookout for him 
which they are, but then it is ultimately her who finds him at the, or I guess he finds her. She mm-hmm. doesn't really find him. He finds her at his property. Right. <laughs> which just seems like if you're looking for Roger Holt, maybe start at his at property, his family's <laughs> property. I don't. And maybe bring the police with you because they're checking it out anyway and they want to know where he is. So, Well, that's what I don't understand. That's the that's what I don't understand. As I understand because Nancy didn't realize that that was the Holt's property until the end. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, okay, well, whatever. But the police apparently knew about this history, right? Mm-hmm. And literally like days, like she, she called the police almost... Like, like at least a few days ago, at least yeah. a good solid handful of days ago between all the different blacking out uh, time, <laughs> time, downtime that we've had. Mm-hmm. Why did they take so long to go investigate this property in the first place? I don't understand. Who knows? But all right. The Bible in the attic didn't really have any significance. The, we knew Roger was looking for it. I guess it was like his grandmother's Bible or someone who had passed away like more than 50 years ago. So this is a really old Bible sitting up there. Did he think that there was some clue to the other family members disappearance in this Bible? Was there any significance to it that he was looking for it for a reason? I don't think so. I think what it is, is that Roger Holt is sentimental. Oh, okay. I I think uh, like, cause we're, we're supposed to kind of understand. Well, I, I guess understand because like think about like what is the re why is he on his why is he hiding this furniture on his family's old property Mm -hmm. there's not really a reason because it i mean aside from the fact that it's empty um that it's unused it wouldn't make sense if you're engaging in criminal activity wouldn't you want your hideout to be somewhere that people couldn't connect you with like right so i i think i think we're supposed to i think the implication is that he does that because he he feels somehow that his family was wronged and he's kind of trying to like venerate his family in, in some kind of way. And so he has this attachment to his family name mm-hmm. and ergo this Bible. But yeah. It seems like he gets up to a lot of snaky business just to cover up what he's doing when what he's doing in the first place isn't even that bad. He's just looking for this slip of paper in a piece of furniture that he could have just gone in and bought he didn't have to steal it like and i guess he did end up buying one of them for what ended up being way too much money but but we'll use in counterfeit bills right okay yeah that's true not real money (laughs) just goes to a lot of trouble to like sabotage nancy trick people like try to fool people into thinking that he's really this amish man who moved from ohio when he was not and like putting the bricks in the road and trying to cause this car accident with Nancy and convince everyone that she's a witch. Just yeah. all of it didn't seem. Yeah. I will say that a flaw that I, or I guess a thing that I've noticed throughout the series is that the criminals never seem to have a reason for their criminal behavior. Mm-hmm. It's just that they are criminals. And so they have a lot of criminal behavior. You know okay. What I mean? Yeah. And so I wonder, I mean, I think that's probably something about the psychology of the time of, you know, thinking, thinking about criminal behavior and thinking about, well, are criminals born or are they made? Mm-hmm. And especially who, when we were reading clue in the crumbling wall mm-hmm. with the little kids, we had Joan and, yes. Joan Fenimore and the little boy that she was hanging out with, we definitely got kind of the implication that Joan got into trouble, but she was really a good girl at heart. Whereas the other boy was definitely a bad child and did Mm -hmm. criminal behavior just because that was who he was or potentially because his father was a criminal. And so he inherited that criminality from his father. Right. That's a great point. Ends up having to actually go to an institution you know, where Mm -hmm. they kind of brush it off and be like, oh, he's being taken care of now, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I think, yeah, part of it is just that, like, that's how they view criminals at this time Mm -hmm. is that, you know, they don't need a reason. They just are going to break the law because that's who they are. Mm, That's a great point. It's, it's definitely one of those things that reading, reading these books is, Make, it makes it challenging reading these books. It makes mm-hmm. it hard to immerse yourself, makes it hard for it to be believable. It's definitely entertaining and fun, mm-hmm. but 
to try to read it in the 21st century is <laughs> it's a little bit of a like wait what why why yeah. why <laughs> Things, questions, I think that people reading these in the 50s and then in the editing in the 70s probably would may or may not have asked themselves. Right. You know. So mm-hmm. overall, Corey, what did you think? A lot of random elements to it that sort of fit together. So mm-hmm. I feel like I wanted it to be, I feel like it had so much potential. Mm-hmm. And like it, it makes me sad in a way that they feel like they have to cram so much action into these books because Mm -hmm. I understand why, like they wanted them to be so exciting for young readers. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they were so successful probably is the fact that, you know, there was always something happening and Nancy was almost always in danger and everything, but it could have been just such a more interesting story if they took out like half of the accidents Mm -hmm. and spent a little more time making it spooky or trying to like embellish the familial relationships, you know, between like Manda and her parents or, you know, like why people are so superstitious and I would have loved to see more superstition in this one. Or even explaining why being a witch is such a bad thing or what would have happened, like put some sort of threat around it. Yeah. No, it was just, we don't like you anymore. So you have to find another place to stay because we think you might be a witch. Right. Yeah, it was just created, again, as another obstacle for Nancy, when instead mm-hmm. it would have been so cool to see it as a as a theme, you right. know, as a as something that, you know, carried through the books and affected the reader instead mm-hmm. of affecting Nancy. Right. Yeah. So a little disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of misogyny in it, but not because of the witch accusations, you know. Right, right, right. Which is weird, because I expected yeah. that, and then it yeah. wasn't that, so. <laughs> yeah. So what score would you give it, Corey? Oh, I feel bad rating it low, but maybe like a two or a three. Yeah, I was, I, <laughs> right after I read it, I was like, this is terrible. This is a <laughs> one. I hate this book. <laughs> but I think I've mellowed a little bit. And yeah, yeah I would probably give it two, two out of five flashlights. Two. I feel like, I feel like it had so much potential and it could have gone somewhere so cool but instead it was disappointing. Mm-hmm. And so for that, I give it to. I thought we were going to get some sort of national secret, like George Washington had <laughs> written a diary and then left it in this secret compartment. In the cage as Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> national treasure three. Amish country. <laughs> <laughs> I kept trying to like, like, okay, like let's get to the mystery because it really just felt like, sabotage after sabotage of Roger Holt that there wasn't there wasn't a lot of clue following it was just Mm -hmm. there there was a sabotage Nancy gets kind of thwarted but pretty much the whole time Nancy's just trying to find Roger Holt right she you know she chases down the the carriage and then which is ultimately the ultimate clue is just that she follows the carriage and then investigates that area that's it that's all even the witch tree symbol, which was supposed to be our first clue, which did lead us to the Lancaster area. We didn't ever see that symbol again until mm. we were already at the Holtz property and knew it was the Holtz property. Right. And literally like, five minutes later, we find Manda and find the like antique furniture. Mm. Like, so it was like totally not important at all the only Mm. important thing was that she they happened upon that man at the dance who was in the carriage that happened to have the furniture in it at that time right if they had not happened upon that they would have never found the property they well maybe they would have by the learning about the schnitz manda and the schnitz and maybe learning that from the old man or whatever but it was just yeah but just to to our readers, unless you're incredibly interested in the portrayal of the Amish, I think that's really the only interesting thing about this book. <laughs> <laughs> I think the rest of it is probably something you could you could skip unless mm-hmm. unless you're doing a read through of it all, you know. Yeah. It's definitely not based on the game or the game is definitely not based on this. We need to read the Phantom Venice one is what we need. <gasps> to read. Yes. Phantom of Venice. That'd we need good. to read that. And then play that game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, so we should we should pick which one we're gonna do next. Let's do let's do like a location specific. Oh one. yes. So, um, there's a uh, mystery of Crocodile Island. 
Crocodile Island sounds good. Yeah. Perfect. So we should do that one. Okay. Okay. So our next book, if you want to read along, number 55, The Mystery of Crocodile Island. Woohoo! Yay. That'll be a good one. Yeah. Excited. Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at Regular Nancy Drew and Twitter at Regular ND. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $1 level receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks for listening. 